very long time, member-based organizations. And since the 1950s, we've been running courses for people from all over the world, first in cooperatives and credit unions, then later on in simply uh, education for leadership and action. So as Anoush mentioned, what I want to do today is just give you a bit of an overview of recent work that we've done exploring innovative types of member-based organizations uh, and to um, pose the question what difference they make for women. Uh, so I'm going to very briefly go over the study. I'm going to talk about the relevance of that study to Oxfam GB's work on women's collectives uh, and cares. Uh, and uh, share some general observations. And then we're going to explore a few case examples, Yogesh and I, uh, specifically from India. Uh, these are producer companies uh, that are uh, throughout India based on new legislation, relatively new legislation uh, permitting their formation. We'll be looking at the Rudi multi-trading company that the Self-Employed Women's Association has um, been instrumental in setting up. And we'll be looking at self -help group, the self-help group bank linkage model uh, involving uh, rural women as another example of, of innovation. Uh, so our question is essentially, does innovation or does the innovation we're seeing here uh, have an advantage in, for social inclusion, particularly of women? And are they by themselves enough? Or are intermediaries essential for them to fulfill their potential? I'm worked out to can you ask uh, Claudia to Claudia, could you uh, put the next slide on? We're having a few problems with our internet connection. Okay. So the study that we did uh, exploring innovative types of member-based organizations uh, stems from the very rapid and deep changes that have been occurring um, geopolitically uh, over the last 10 to 20 years. We've been seeing worldwide a shrinkage and a retreat of government activity through the public sector and an expansion of the private sector. Uh, as a result, a lot of the previous responsibilities of the state have been privatized. Uh, either a shift to the private sector in for-profit service enterprises, or a, a shift to the non-profit sector, or a shift to unpaid and voluntary sectors. What we've been interested in seeing <coughs> is this tremendous social innovation that's occurring in what we're calling, or what others are calling, the hybrid areas of overlap between these sectors, so between the state and the private sector, between the private sector and civil society sectors, uh, between civil society and state. So the, one way of illustrating that is that uh, whereas before we had a fairly substantial role of the state in the economy, uh, now with the state retreating, we have, um, an ex and, and the expansion of the private sector, what we're seeing is quite a few innovations in that area of overlap. And the three examples that we're going to be talking about today uh, are innovations that are occurring in that area of overlap, whether they are the producer companies in India that are a hybrid, really, between uh, private sector and member-based organizations or cooperatives, uh, the Rudy uh, multi-trading company is an example of a, a private company in, embedded within uh, an association, a member-based organization. And the SHG bank linkage 
model is an example of how informal and formal sectors have been uh, linked uh, without uh, without a problem, it seems. <laughs> uh, next. Okay, all right. So when we started to look at member-based organizations uh, that are innovative, we posed the following questions. What innovative linkages are there between member-based organizations and the private sector? And what innovative linkages uh, are there between informal and formal sectors? We ask the question, why are these new relationships or hybrid organizations emerging? And then the so what question. Are women in communities taking more control over their livelihoods as a result? Uh, and are these new entities or new linkages more effective as a vehicle for women's access to resources? Finally, are these social innovations inclusive or are intermediaries required to guarantee that inclusion? Just to bring you, those of you who've been part of this as webinar series uh, from the beginning, I wanted to bring you back to the original conceptual framework that Oxfam GB uh, presented. Uh, and just to add, and what I've done in this diagram, I've highlighted in yellow the sort of part of that conceptual framework that we're dealing with in this webinar, and to show you that we have inserted a triangle with the term intermediary to show that whatever the legal and policy framework uh, there is as an incentive for innovation. Um, for there to be really effective and inclusive collective action, there often needs to be an intermediary uh, connecting uh, the women's collectives or the member-based organizations uh, to the opportunities in the legal and policy environment and making it work for them. So what, what we have seen, and, uh, and I should say that this study has been uh, uh, global in reach, uh, what, what we have seen as it applies to the Indian context is that there are very interesting and innovative hybrids uh, in India that, co that join the member-based organization or the cooperative model or cooperative idea with the private sector. And these are the ones we're going to be talking about today. Oops, sorry. So now, now I'm going to pass it over to your Gesh, who's going to be talking about producer companies. Thank you, Alison. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the same computer I'm I'm, I'm using that uh, Alison was uh, using. So I. I uh, I should my my sound should be okay. I am not sounding like I'm I'm grounded in in, in water. Basically, it's, it's a lot of snow here, so we are we are in the snow, not not water. Uh, thank you, Alison, for a, a nice uh, introduction. Uh, I will basically uh, talk about uh, a couple of examples of such innovations that are happening in in India. Uh, one particularly about uh, the producer companies. Uh, as Alison said, producer company is a, is a hybrid form of uh, an organization uh, which uh, has the elements of uh, a cooperative, uh, like one member, one more principal, but it's under a liberal fr uh, framework of, of uh, the companies in, in India. And this uh, act uh, was, uh, or the, the Indian Companies Act was amended in 2002, and that allowed uh, 10 or more primary producers to, to, to formulate a company. And uh, basically, uh, this legislation was uh, was necessary because uh, 
primarily uh, corporate uh, cooperatives were the only lead and form under which uh, the producers can come together to access market and uh, that particular form uh, had a lot of limitations in terms of uh, the state control and uh, the the state officer who is responsible for the cooperatives had the final say on on what the cooperatives could do or not do but under the new framework uh, uh, the, the 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 influence of state has been has been minimized and the, the companies are, are 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 free to do what what they want to do so we'll we'll take up one example of uh, a producer company in uh, in india which works uh, across three states three eastern states of jharkhand bihar and chhattisgarh and this particular uh, company uh, is owned uh, and managed by 3000 uh, women uh, producers who are mainly working in the, in the silk sector they produce they, are, they produce uh, silk yarn uh, called tasar which is like a indian tropical uh, uh, silk yarn uh, they are spread the, the operations of the company are spread over 120 villages across three uh, three states and uh, the the last uh, confirmed turnover figure is uh, over 2 million uh, us dollars and the profit uh, 71000 basically how the how the company works uh, is that i mean it is a producer company but uh, the real innovation is is in terms of the combination of different institutions that come under this uh, framework so uh, there are four types of uh, institutions involved and un under this uh, structure at the base are uh, self help groups so this uh, this uh, producer company and uh, these groups were promoted by uh, a national ngo called pradhan so very well known well respected organization in india so they they had their operations in these three states where they promoted this self help groups of women these are primarily informal affinity groups uh, women come together uh, in groups of uh, 10 15 and then they save weekly a uh, small amount of uh, money and then they they rotate that money and also they borrow from outside so the primary purpose of these self help groups is this saving and credit now some of the members from these sgs are also producers of uh, silk yarn so the next structure within within this is the mutual benefit trust these mutual benefit trust consists of 20 to 30 uh, members picked up from different sgs 3 to 4 sgs and these uh, mutual benefit trusts are the first tier farmer organization or first tier producer organization and their main so they these are uh, locally registered profit making entities uh, and their main responsibility is to produce this silk yarn and and, uh, and produce up, uh, up to a quality that is uh, that is demanded in the market above it is the real producer company which is a national collective and the role of the producer company is that they they first of all procure the inputs for the mbts and then they they aggregate the final produce and then and they market it the producer company is actually owned by the members of the mbt so each mbt member has a share in the producer company and uh, while it's owned and governed by the producers it's managed professionally so they hire professionals to manage the professional operations of the company and another uh, structure about this is that the producer company gets into partnerships with the with the private sector companies for for value addition for marketing and also they have a stake in their own company uh, for value addition and marketing so basically uh, the producer company uh, act enables uh, these mbts to be part of a uh, larger producer company and and also they can get into joint venture with the private uh, company now why this innovation uh as as uh, many of you might know uh, after 19 uh, uh, 90s uh, the the government of india liberalized and the economy opened up and there is a lot of economic growth happening but uh, the growth in the agriculture sector was not uh, happening at that space or or in fact was stagnant or declining uh so this uh, and and the existing uh, framework under which the producers can effectively participate in the, in the growing economy were not uh, were not enabling enough for, for them to effectively participate so this new law uh came to address the weaknesses in the existing uh, uh, cooperative framework and uh, and also this uh, this innovation actually came to to address the need for for having a combination of different structure to address the needs of the of the producers 
So, so, so what? What has happened uh, when when these three thousand uh, women uh, came together? Or they started very small, but now they are, they are over three thousand. So, what what exactly has happened? In this particular case, their income uh, has increased in some cases over fifty percent, and uh, they their income has increased not only because they are participating uh, as an activity in the producer company, but also because they have shares in this uh, producer company, and. Uh, <coughs> this uh, has also enabled that different uh, institutions in this model can leverage on each other's strength so the SLGs uh, were working together for for the last 10 years or maybe more uh, because the NGO has promoted them so there was a social base there and this model actually enabled to build on that uh, social uh, mobilization and, and and cohesiveness within the members also enabled uh, the producer company to partner with the private sector and also effectively work with the MBTs. Uh, so, in a way, it was it was uh, a structure that was accountable, uh, accountable, and also inclusive. And what were the main success factors? I think the main success factor in in this particular case was that they focused on locally available uh, uh, livelihood opportunities. There was a lot of time and uh, investment in terms of developing uh, the technology. Like previously, uh, the woman used to uh, make these yarns uh, purely manually, but they invested a lot, a lot of, lot in technology to to come up with improved uh, machines for 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 making the thread. Uh, there was a lot of investment in in improving the efficiency, and also more importantly in community mobilization. As I said, that NGO was working for so many years in that area. So it was not that uh, because the legislation came and, and they, they found formulated the company. They actually built on the base that was created beforehand. And uh, the success was also in integration of a lot of uh, structures uh, like the self-help group, uh, the mutual benefit trust, producer company and the, and the private company. And also a larger role for women not only in SSG, uh, MBT, but also in the in the governance of the producer company. So the, the producer company, a uh, lot of uh, uh, board of directors are uh, women who are, who are the owners of the company. And, and also more importantly, factors like, uh, um, like most of these producers need uh, continuous supply of uh, of money so they, they, they want quick returns for for their uh, for their services so the the, pro, uh, the this model was able to provide them quick returns of of their efforts there was a lot of efficiency transparency honesty and integrity in day to day functioning of the organization so that that's uh, from the producer's perspective that was very important that uh, uh, the transactions were, were transparent there was honesty integrity and more importantly most importantly i think they were getting the kind of services they wanted from that organization so if there are any clarification questions then i'll be happy to answer them uh, now and then we'll move on to the second case of the cooperative sector and the BCM um, I can see two posts in one side of Kenya, which is asking, asking going, going back to uh, what Edison was saying, saying that, that uh, the, the, the graphic shows um, uh, overlap uh, in private uh, and user side sectors in their overlap with the, the state as well. Um, and, and the second question that has come from two ways, um, was the CCM completely new uh, or, uh, or is the innovation, I'm sorry, I'm missing the... Yeah, 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 so we got the question. So if you can answer, read those questions and answer them to that. Okay, okay I will try to answer. Uh, it's basically the diagram that uh, Alison presented uh, showing uh, the before and after scenario. Uh, I mean, obviously, there, there are models where the state is also involved. So those models, I think, would fall closely uh, around the nucleus of that uh, particular model. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the, um, in terms of the, the, the two uh, circle diagrams, we're just focusing on those innovative member-based organizations that are illustrative of that overlap between private sector um, and civil society. But there are many other examples that we looked at that are uh, illustrations of, a, of uh, overlap between the state 
and the private sector or the state and civil society. So it's just a, it, it's just that we have focused on that one area. But what is very obvious is that all the innovation that we're seeing is occurring at what they call the interstices between these sectors that we have got so used to describing civil society, market, and state to the point where they're not really as distinct categories as they used to be. Okay. Uh, there's one question around weaknesses of the cooperative uh, framework. The under the cooperative framework, basically uh, these uh, uh, are done at the at the province or the state level, and the uh, the registrar of the cooperative is the, the government department, which uh, has a, a veto power over whatever the cooperative decides. So ultimately. Uh, the under uh, the, the the whole autonomy of the organization is undermined by the by the registrar of the cooperative. So that becomes a bottleneck uh, if if the the producers want to do something on on their own. So 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 the bottleneck is every time you have to go through the registrar. It's a bureaucratic process and 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 uh, and a lot of state control uh, over the, over the cooperatives. So that 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 was one. And uh, and and the, the state does it because they also do investments in these uh, in these cooperatives. And the other question was, was the producer company completely new? So the the producer company uh, amendment was was created in 2002. The producer companies act uh, was there from 1940s. So this new amendment was made in 2002 to specifically address uh, the the issues of uh, cooperatives. And the, the new act actually enabled the cooperatives to re-register as producer companies and function independently as, as producer companies so that they don't have to go through the registrar again. So the, the, the Act allows uh, 10 or more producers to come together. The Act also allows producer organizations to come together to be part of the producer company. The Act also allows the existing cooperatives to, to re register as producer company and, and, and function as, as it's, it's mostly like a, like a private company but with elements of uh, uh, a cooperative like one uh, one member one vote principal and 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 so it has uh, it's a hybrid between a cooperative and a private limited company um there there are questions, questions coming up, coming up, up on the screen, screen. Um, um, and and one of the one questions, questions and we will we will we probably take one, one or two questions, questions now, now but then at least uh, others uh, at, the uh, at the end of the, end of the presentation, presentation. And one, and one question, question that uh, is, 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 is um, you know, what about, what about the capital, the capital? Uh, yeah. and, uh, and, the, and the, the restriction on capital, capital, capital and how has, how has it uh, addressed that issue? So if you can take, take that, that one, and we'll probably hold other, other questions until the end, end of the presentation, presentation if that's all right. All right. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think the new act particularly does not adequately ad uh, adequately address the the issue of capital because only the members can uh, can raise uh, equity right now and uh, and the external uh, the company cannot raise uh, external capital uh, for for equity so that that's one of the that is one of the constraints especially specifically uh, for the producer companies who are into uh, into uh, capital intensive uh, activities so that has been one of the challenges uh, so far uh, and and that uh, the the act doesn't address because what the act does is is it it, it, it allows a, a hybrid of uh, organizational forms but it, it doesn't allow the hybrid of, of of finance so I mean the finance the company still has to get from the from the market and and uh, one challenge has been that this particular company uh, is uh, is been able to survive at, a, at a, by by borrowing from the market at interest rate of uh, 15 16 percent. So that has been one of the challenges. There are two questions, two that, questions are that, that I think that I would, think that I would uh, ask you to uh, uh, address uh, right now. Right now. Uh, and uh, if you can just to what Edith was saying around roll around the immediate immediate. immediate. So, so if you can just say a few things how, how critical how that critical was, that was yeah. what role that played. Go ahead. So very good question. That role was, and again we'll touch touch upon the role of intermediary organization. I think in this particular case the, the role of uh, intermediary organization or, or Tadan was very, very crucial because they were the promoters of those SSGs. They invested in developing uh, the technology that is being used by the by the producers. 
they played a, a lot of role in in uh, formulation of the of the company and they continue to play a role uh, basically what happened the the, uh, the, the person who uh, was working with these uh, communities who was who was dealing with them uh, on productivity enhancement on community mobilization ended up leaving pradhan and uh, and joined the company as a ceo so this person is actually uh, the chief executive officer of the comp- uh, of the company now it's not uh, it doesn't have a share in the company but he uh, he is employee of the company now so in a way the role of pradhan is is ongoing i mean you have to see it from uh, different activities so uh, there are uh, activities uh, uh, pre cocoon activities they call so uh, activities where uh, you you make the cocoon so in in, in that one ngos involvement is is a lot because uh, there are a lot of uh, government uh, um sort of subsidies are available uh, for uh, plantation and and for making cocoon so but after once uh, the company pre- uh, buys cocoon from different producers then it's uh, the the involvement of ngo is is minimal this is basically the producer company managing its own operation so there is uh, there is an uh, sort of an ongoing uh, interdependency between uh, the 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 cocoon producers and the the, the producers of of the yarn and the the cocoon producers are are still working with the ngo and the and the, the producer company is is, is uh, approaching independence because they they have a ceo now yes, yes, i think yes, i think yes, we'll yes, hold on to hold on to and for now and come back to come back to them, them after, after, the, after the, the two more the presentations two so if you can just move on to the second phase yes all right a uh, lot of questions and uh, i'll be happy to to respond now or or in future and and by the way we uh, when we were doing this study we just like scanned some of the examples and uh, the idea is that we will go further deep into these cases or select few cases and 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 go deeper <coughs> the second example is uh, is from uh, the self uh, employ- uh, employed women's association in india and particularly their work in the agriculture sector uh, um, just just to introduce uh, seva uh, is is a well known uh, well respected organization in in india it started as a trade union uh, movement uh, and then uh, did a lot of work uh, for women uh, empower uh, empowerment uh, economic empowerment and also on on financial inclusion their networking uh, communication so so th- there is a network of more than uh, a million uh, women uh, workers that say or works with uh, it started off uh, its operations in, um, in in urban areas but slowly moved into rural areas and uh, most of their rural members work in uh, in the agriculture sector and this particular intervention is is in the agriculture sector where they created a, a rural distribution uh, network uh, that links the small producers to consumers and they utilize their existing network of self help groups uh, their institutions around microfinance insurance uh, capacity building and also uh, their their communication facilities like uh, seva radio uh, just like uh, uh, <coughs> pradhan this also has a complex mix of institutions involved uh, that reach out to uh, the small producers that includes uh, seva as a, as a member based organization there are district level associations in the supply chain uh, there are private sector players and uh, there are uh, seva supported marketing organization that support uh, the, the the initiative and also they partner heavily with the, with the government for funded programs right now their outreach is uh, is uh, 265000 small and marginal farmers and uh, they directly employ 15000 uh, uh, these rural procurement and sales managers oh sorry yeah, 1500 sorry and they call it uh, rudy bains i mean the bain they they bain in sister so so they, they are all, in in lot of their in initiatives you will find bain 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 so these are rudy bains and uh, the last turnover was uh, over 1 and 1/2 million us dollars so why basically the model is that there are uh, small and marginal farmers uh, who uh, many of them are seva members uh, and then there are uh, these uh, procurement uh, centers Uh, set up in the villages and then there are uh, from the procurement center the uh, the, the pack they, they do sorting packaging and then the the, the products go to uh, a distribution hub from there it goes to uh, the private sector players it goes to retailers also they have their retail shops in the villages and also some of these rudy bains 
go door to door selling these uh, products. Now, why the innovation? As I, as I said, uh, many of the SEVA members uh, were working in the agriculture sector, and uh, as many of uh, the, the small and marginal farmers in India and across the globe face uh, problems around uh, market access, uh, lack of a bargaining power, uh, lack of uh, storage processing f uh, facilities, so they, the SEVA members were also facing the same problems and, and, and they were forced to distress sell and, and also were subject to, to exploitation by traders and, and middlemen and intermediaries. And SEVA's response to this was that they had this uh, network of SSGs and, and member-based organizations already operating and many of them uh, were working in the agriculture sector. So, so they basically relied on Gandhian principles of uh, self-governed, uh, self-sustaining local economy. Uh, where the, the the producers uh, were linked to uh, the the consumers utilizing the existing base that they have already had and and basically in order to do that they uh, they had to go through a, a, a private limited company for the profit making entity and uh, the innovation was that the existing seva uh, framework network allowed that to happen so what so so what if if this allowed to happen what exactly happened in this particular case, uh, it was uh, a direct market access to a lot of uh, small and marginal farmers uh, where uh, they were able to sell their uh, products directly to the procurement centers that were set up by, by SEVA. There were multiple employment opportunities, direct employment opportunities for women members who were employed by the uh, either by the procurement center or the distribution center or as uh, sales managers. Uh, another important factor was uh, access to high quality consumer products uh, uh, locally uh, they, they were, uh, which were distributed through this distribution network to the rural consumers and more importantly the owners of uh, the company are, are these uh, SEVA members so the, the capital or the, uh, their input, their share is, lo is, is rotated locally. Now wh what were the success factors? The success factors were, uh, as I said, the continuous work of SEVA with these communities, grassroots foundation, and a lot of internal cohesiveness. If you talk to SEVA members, they are, they, they as if they, they, they belong to each other, and there's a lot of cohesiveness uh, uh, within them. The other factor was uh, service provision. So the, the, the members who are directly part of Rudy, they give a lot of importance to the kind of services they get from the initiative, like uh, direct payment, on-time payment, and also uh, the, the services that the, the consumers get. And also the, 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 the initiative was able to have a lot of external linkages, like uh, Unilever helped them uh, create the supply chain. Uh, they are also considering uh, getting products from outside companies that could be distributed using this uh, distribution network. So there were a lot of very strong uh, external linkages with the SEVA and outside the SEVA members, including uh, the government. And uh, as, a, as a result, I mean, some of the SEVA members uh, were able to increase their income uh, by 50% as, as the, the project claimed. And also, uh, some of them, uh, the, specifically the Rudy Bench, were able to earn as high as 5,000 rupees uh, a month, which is uh, $100, $120, yeah which is a lot considering many of them don't even uh, earn uh, a dollar a day. Um, I, I, don't I, I don't see a particular, uh, uh, question, uh, question, uh, question. Um, uh, I think uh, one just came, just came uh, from uh, Kuwait. Uh, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, pose a question, question uh, which uh, uh, was posed earlier, uh, earlier uh, which can uh, be related to, to uh, both uh, case studies. Uh, what are the what implications or what are the um, influence, influence on the gender, on the gender relation, relation. Um, um, given the given fact, the fact that, that these are exclusive uh, women, uh, women member based member based of the organization. organization. Uh, so if uh, you have any insight, you can take a minute to quickly explain that. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just start off by saying that we were not actually looking at this, if in the study we were not looking at, at that level of depth. Uh, but I'm sure Yogesh must have picked up uh, insight from that based on his uh, fieldwork experience there. Yeah, I think uh, in both the initiatives uh, and both the organizations, Pradhan and Seva, dedicated their efforts to specifically focus on women. So there was a, 
uh, there was an intent, there was a specific effort only to work with the with the women, and that I think uh, ensured their uh, their participation. For example, uh, in in case of Pradhan, uh, most of the members, the 3,000 members, are indigenous women, and also they are uh, the decision makers higher up in in the producer company. So uh, a dedicated effort was made to involve women not only in in, in production but also in, in in decision making. I think that uh, that had a lot of influence on on, on what happened. Mm -hmm. And Seva, we all know it's, it's a women's uh, women's organization with a lot of involvement of women. Um, can now I think we can now move on to the third, third, case, case, third case, case and then come uh, back, and then come back to the uh, questions uh, there after. Uh, there are, um, um, I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry. Um, um, there are there are there are questions that just popped up. Popped so, uh, so I will I will I'll, 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 well, I'm well, a little intimidated and surrounded, surrounded by my Indian, Indian colleagues here to, to speak, to speak about, about another, another uh, Indian, Indian model. model. But, but what, what I find very interesting about the self-help group, group bank, bank linkage, linkage model, model, model is that it, it has, has overcome, overcome this, this problem, problem in many, in many places, places where, where there are, there are so many advantages, advantages of being, being informal, informal, but as, but as soon, soon as you want, you want to access um, resources, resources, external resources, resources there, there is usually, usually a requirement, requirement for registration, formalization, and, and often, that, often kills that kills all the benefits, all the benefits of informality. And what has happened, happened here with the SHG Bank Linkage model, model is that informality, informality has been accommodated within, within the model. The model. So, so um, the innovation then, then, then is that, is that We've got, We've got informal, informal collectors, collectors self-help self groups, uh, uh, pioneered by, by Myrada in India, in India but has, has since been, been uh, taken, uh, taken up nationally. nationally. Um, um, so, so what, what these, these informal self-help groups are able to do, do is borrow, is borrow money from formal banks to online to, to, to their members. So there's, no there's no formal, formal registration required. required. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and no, no bank, bank approval of individual, individual loans, loans is required. required. The self-help self -help group access, access the loans loan on the basis, on the basis of, of the, the credit, credit worthiness, worthiness of the uh, SHG as a collective. I'm sorry, I just got uh, 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 a message uh, from, from uh, Claudia that Claudia there was an there echo was and echo and people may not have uh, uh, heard that clearly, so if you can just say one or two things more quickly. Okay, the basic uh, idea with the with this is that informality can be a real advantage for for collective activity, women's collectives included, uh, and the uh, self-help group bank linkage model is an example where the self-help groups have been allowed to um, borrow money from the banks um, without any formal registration uh, based on their uh, history of credit worthiness. The bank does not scrutinize uh, how those uh, loans uh, are dispersed or who they are dispersed to. Uh, it's uh, The, the self-help group has um, uh, discretionary uh, responsibility for, for doing that. Okay. Okay. So the, the reason why this uh, innovation was set up is because obviously like in many places women's access to commercial savings and credits credit services were was highly restrictive um, women in these self-help groups um, that had been operating for many many years um, uh, as uh, rotating savings and accessing credit uh, through my rider um, sorry, I'm lost, lost the. Uh, I, I'm lo sorry, I'm losing this thing here. Um, they did not want. They, they needed to access uh, services from commercial banks, and commercial banks were being put under enormous pressure to provide uh, rural outreach. So the way of uh, reconciling these two demands was to uh, allow these informal self-help groups 
to link with the commercial banks. The women did not want to uh, be registered because they feared the kind of bureaucratic interference that would occur um, as a result of that. Uh, so essentially what happened after many, many years was a, um, a change in India's central banking policy uh, nationwide. So what's happened as a result is uh, obviously women's collective access to and, distribu and distribution of credit has increased. Um, and this has meant that women have been able to increase the loan amounts for a diversified livelihood strategy for individual members on a very uh, incremental and self-paced um, way. And uh, because we, we included this example because although uh, not everybody is uh, a farmer, uh, but most of these self-help groups are rurally based and m most women directly or indirectly are dependent upon um, farm enterprise. So the access to these uh, loans and savings facilities has allowed them to invest in land, in agricultural inputs, uh, business investments, uh, as well as education as, a, as an intergenerational um, the, uh, livelihood strategy. Um, um, Thank you, sir. And let me take just one second, one second to add second one point on, on that, that one. one. Um, in 1991, um, um, NABARD, which NABARD, is the National Agricultural Bank, Bank, Bank um, um, issued a notice, issued a notice or a circular circle saying, saying why, why should banks recognize the nine formal self-help groups as legal entities, 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 which was, which was contra, contra uh, uh, legislation. legislation. Um, and, um, and that, that be the way the way for banks, banks to, to, to link with this informal group. And, and, and that uh, 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 was in a way a small, small but political uh, in a piece, uh, piece of legislation. Uh, it, was, it was considered a civil legislation, though it was circular. circular. And that, and that really, really uh, opened, uh, opened up the space, space for informal groups to link with informal banking institutions. So I just wanted to add that and then move on to any questions and questions. Uh, uh, maybe that was live or not? Oh, no, maybe not. No, okay, fine. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, they, I haven't seen any questions for the questions on the last case study, but I have noted a uh, couple of them uh, from the previous one, um, which are Talking about, you know, uh, in the in the um, in the in the company that uh, Seva has created, um, what portion of the marketing is done for the agriculture produce, and what is around consumer products? And I I'm not sure whether we will have that information uh, per se. Um, second question uh, is about you know uh, those two two hundred sixty five thousand women who are members of it. Are there members uh, who are, are there people who are non-members uh, in that um, geography who have also benefited because of that intervention from Seva? So um, I'm not sure. Um, would you like to take that question on? Yeah, I mean those two. Can you hear now? Okay. So. Uh, these 265,000 members are, are, are SEVA members who have shares in this company. Uh, but uh, not necessarily that all the 265 are participating in the, in the activity. So right now uh, there are close to 35,000 farmers who are actually supplying to SEVA. So, the, so there are the SEVA stakeholders or shareholders and then the SEVA members who actually participate in the, in the activity as farmers. So that number is close to 35,000. Thanks, Yogesh. Um, uh, yes, the, uh, there's a question around, you know, was that implication of uh, that legislation that I talked about was national? Yes, uh, that has been, uh, a, that was a national circular by the National Agriculture and Rural Development Bank, and it, it applies uh, across the country. Um, so, uh, there are uh, questions that have come. Um, Alan asks, 
are banks happy with the repayment records of the self help group um uh, the other question um i'm reading other questions uh, so maybe uh, yogesh wants to or, or alison wants to take that uh, question uh, what what about about the repayment rates and performance of self help group is a with the, the links with the banks yeah the uh one of the uh sort of rules i suppose of of this uh, model is that the self help groups keep um very stringent records of their uh of, of what they take what they're borrowing and what they're what they're um dispersing uh and so long as those uh, self help groups maintain um a you know re re repayment record uh that's up to up to par i'm not actually sure what the percentage rate of re of, of repayment is uh then they are able to continue the relationship with the bank so it's very much a, a self monitoring system uh but as long as they are uh, repaying then they can continue in that uh, relationship and as far as i know the repayment rate has been very high across the board um, just to quickly really add at the macro level picture um uh, in india right now uh, the credit you know or the capital delivery from a mainstream banking institution to self help group uh, is to the tune of last uh, recorded number is 6 billion dollars uh and and the total savings that self help groups have created in the system uh is roughly uh 2 billion dollars uh so as a system um banking institution has leveraged the capital based on the savings of the self help group and uh, apparently there is a 8 billion dollar worth of capital rotating through uh this self help groups right now in the country uh maybe i could also comment on Talia's question uh with the self help groups uh whether or not they're exclusively men or or exclusively women or or men are involved as well uh my recollection from the field work i did several years ago is that uh the repayment rates and the success rates of exclusive women's self help groups were very much better than those of men and that had it's something to do with the fact that women tended to be based um uh in in one place all the time men were much more likely to have to travel to other places for employment and so that sort of maintain, maintaining that the the regularity of of savings and repayment uh was much more difficult um thanks um uh, thanks alison um one question that is coming you know i think set of questions coming around gender relations um around how um uh, this impacts the gender relation whether when the when the collectives are successful whether men try and take over uh, so that those are one of the set of questions the other set of questions that i think are, are simmering in people's mind which are you know showing on the screen are around how does this then relate to experiences in africa um so um we'll take just one step more on the just gender relation issues uh, from a indian context and then move on to uh, the african context and if people can put, would like to comment uh, from the floor um uh, if they would like to say anything uh, from their experiences so um go ahead um let me let me uh, you know just share my own uh, personal experience on this on the gender relations uh, what what is happening around this is that you know this is even though the numbers uh, uh, of numbers of uh, the amount of money that's flowing through the system is quite looks quite large uh, at, at a national level 6 billion dollars is not a big amount uh, from many you know a lot of point of view and um, there is a parallel system in the uh, which is uh, delivering agriculture credit uh by the state through uh, cooperatives which continues to be very large and a highly subsidized credit and so men tend to focus more on getting that capital rather than the capital that uh, is flowing through self help group movement um and and there's a lot of uh, uh rent seeking behavior that goes on in the in the agriculture credit delivery and so small farmer or small producer is always uh not uh able to access that system and that's one of the reasons why self help group movement is seen as one of the better 
vehicle for delivering financial services uh, than agriculture. But the jury is still out on that one. Um, so uh, anybody uh, who would like to now um, raise a point or uh, uh, contribute or, or uh, ask any question, please raise your hand so that we can uh, give, uh, give the floor to them. Thank you. Anyone? Hi, um, Alan Doran here. Um, I asked, asked a question a little while ago about. Um, I'll, I'll just take uh, Monique's question of I'm whether sorry. women can uh, access these uh, subsidized bank loans. In theory, yes, they can. Um, in practice, uh, there is a lot of um, you know um, bureaucracy in that. There is a lot of social network that that works there, and often you know the bigger farmers uh, and people uh, at least uh, you know capture that capital more than the small producer and farmers. And often, uh, again, um, there are large population that do not have land. They work as uh, day laborers or sharecroppers and they have difficulty in accessing uh, that capital as well, uh, which is not a barrier uh, within the self-help group mode of delivery of capital. Uh, but but let's, uh, let's, you know, it's uh, 10.08 now. Uh, we have 20, good 20, 22 minutes uh, before uh, we have to close. So if we can uh, have the comments from the floor and anybody who would like to share experiences from African context uh, relating to that. Okay, I'm just reminded that there's a final slide that uh, you know Yogesh and Alison would like to complete their presentation with. So let's go to that and then come back to the floor. Just to wrap up the presentation, um, our concern has been to both look at what the innovation is, uh, but also to see whether as a result of that innovation uh, there is greater social inclusion. And of course, in, given our discussion today, we're really talking about whether these innovations uh, benefit women and include women. Uh, and the conclusion that we've come to across the board, but particularly in these case examples, is that even if there are legal and regulatory changes, uh, these are not enough to uh, provide either the incentive or the protection uh, or the information or the resources uh, for uh, a, a lot of women's collectives to uh, manage on their own, to take this forward on their own. There is um, an intensive and long-term capacity building required and this is really the the big story here uh, about the influence uh, about the way in which these um, women's collectives or, and these social innovations, including women, um, they have very much been uh, accompanied by and helped by very long-standing uh, intermediary organisations. Uh, Pradhan, uh, in the case of the producer companies. Uh, the Self-Employed Women's Association in the case of Rudy, uh, Myrada in the case of the um, Self-Help Group Bank Linkage Model. Uh, now these are not fly-by-night NGOs, they've been there 20, 25 years uh, earning an enormous amount of, of respect nationwide um, and, uh, and, a, and a huge grassroots uh, following. So I, I think that really is the, the the, the, the story here that I think we can relate to uh, questions about the African context. And I, it, just to return there then to say that the insertion from our point of view, uh, uh, with, uh, without having asked permission of Oxfam GB to do this, from our point of view, that triangle with in, intermediary ne needs to be there. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, I, that, that's just wrapping it up from our end. But we look forward to more questions.
Hi, thanks so much. Thanks, um, Allison, and your guests for this great presentation. Um, I had a question about. Um, yeah, can folks hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Okay, thanks. I had a question about um, the the gender. I had a question about uh, addressing different gender issues, and I'm just wondering, in these case studies, what a, what about these approaches um, work to really address underlying gendered issues that might have excluded women initially from these different, um, you know, access to the market and negotiating um, with others? Um, and and I guess in some ways that's related to um, the earlier question that I had was um, around do other women who are not part of these member-based organizations benefit from the work that's been done um, through these member organization groups? Um, or, you know, are they paving the way and actually transforming the systems, or are they really just working to get their members um, better access in the existing structures and systems? This is such a great. This is such a great question, <laughs> um, and I, I would say, uh, just as a, an outside observer and having spent some time with Sewa and with Myrada, uh, that the, the at, at a very fundamental level, uh, those organisations are working to transform the system, in the sense. Uh, it, particularly if you take the case of um, the Self-Employed Women's Association um, that uh, is informed very much by Gandhian uh, principles which um, ha has struggled really to um, uh, deal with a, 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 an economic growth model that is much more oriented to uh, export markets than uh, in internal markets. So uh, Sewa has uh, been very clear about the importance of um, involving women in a transformation of local economies and for them to be front and center in that. Uh, you, you know, that, that's probably the best example of that. In terms of uh, Myrada, um, one, one part of your question was around whether or not they uh, women who are not part of these uh, self-help groups in this case, uh, whether they are included. The, the, the Myrata model is that uh, to the extent that Myrata has the capacity to um, keep encouraging new groups to form, uh, you know, those groups of the, the, more, of the poorer women or the, the most marginalized um, they work. They they very gradually and incrementally build themselves up to the level of the other groups that are that are uh, already much more successful. The real challenge is that without Myrada's intervention, without the the ability to do that kind of capacity building, um, it, it relies very much on existing uh, self-help groups to uh, mentor and shepherd and and encourage the formation of, of new groups because they're not necessarily in a position to embrace new membership if they've already uh, got to the point where they are accessing uh, a more diverse, um, more, more diverse uh, financial products or at a, at a higher level in terms of, um, of the amount of money that they can borrow from banks. So, you know, I, I think in, in most cases you're seeing attempts to transform the system, but at the same time being very pragmatic about trying to uh, take advantage and, and ensure 
that women have access to the opportunities that exist in the current system. Thank you, Alison. Um, there, are, there are, I can see a number of questions uh, connecting with, you know, how does this uh, transform gender relations and, and what ha what is happening there? Uh, it's a, you know, quite a quite a um, uh, large area of, of the, you know discussion. Uh, but you know, as as we, you know, just in the interest of time, I'm wondering if uh, anybody uh, from the from the floor would like to. Um, a comment about uh, now, especially how this uh, you know contrasts or, or resonates with your experiences, especially in in, in the African continent. Uh, it'll be good to hear that. Hi, this is Talia. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I um, was just thinking I would say a little bit about how this. Um, coincides with some of the research from Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Mali, uh, the research in women's collective action. I think uh, one point is that we found, especially in uh, uh, Tanzania and in Mali, that much of the collective action that we found um, was externally promoted. Um, and so this confirms the importance of long-term support of intermediaries or externals, in effect, um, to make it work. Um, the, the other question, which I think we've uh, been talking around, is that there is uh, some evidence that informal, group, informal groups address more of the gender-specific needs of women, of labor sharing and uh, time issues, um, uh, maybe support and confidence and leadership, um, while the formal organizations and spaces may address um, more of the uh, monetized market needs of women and um, increase income. Um, I, I think that one of the things that I'm uh, really curious about between these three case studies and what we're uh, researching in Africa is um, what are the cases where it fails? Um, what are the characteristics of the intermediaries, not just factors of success, but the factors that make the difference between situations where it's not working and it is working? Um, because in addition to what I heard um, about the need for the intermediary to build capacity and um, and organize kind of the structures, another thing seems to be to have a very entrepreneurial um, uh, intermediary or set up um, a, an actor that will really be looking for the market uh, on a continuous basis that provides the returns to the local groups because obviously people will not be continuing to be involved um, if they uh, aren't um, increasing their incomes and that's not always easy. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Delia. Um, the way useful. Um, Martin was talking about. I think he has left uh, the the room. Um, he was talking about uh, how um, the in, in Africa, in Nairobi, in Kenya, and the the experience is similar. Um, Uwe, would you like to come in uh, and share the experience that you you were talking about uh, about uh, the small cooperative that you are working with um, in Western Africa? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I I I mean, it's not uh, very um, systematic and 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 uh, 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 very representative uh, experience, maybe, but. Uh, um, uh, we we have the we are working with women the groups self help groups uh, the village and various amount of associations in the, in Mali where um, in in the Dogon 
uh, area, uh, for those who know that. Um, very difficult for agriculture. Women are very um, used to do very small scale uh, agriculture um, for many for vegetable production. But um, there are also a lot of um, food security and nutritional security issues. So um, what we were um, working on is basically a combined effort of our um, uh, uh, nutrition initiative and the conservation agriculture initiative to bring um, production techniques to small scale um, um, uh, production groups, uh, but to produce high value nutritional, high, high nutrition uh, crops, to produce a, a flower that is called uh, misoda, and uh, that is then, um, you know, obviously those crops then the harvest is processed uh, collectively by the women groups and then um, given out uh, through various outlets including, you know, governmental uh, um, uh, supplementing feeding uh, stations and the women themselves also get more and more involved in actually getting a missile out. Um, um, uh, I think the, 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 the interesting thing here, as I said, uh, I think also in one, in, in, in one comment is obviously to maintain that um, um, system when production as well as consumption or uh, demand is actually fluctuating quite strongly. In this case, obviously, to some extent, um, it will uh, depend on the demand by the governmental organization, I mean, institutions who demand supplementing feeding, uh, uh, who have demand on the supplementing feeding side. Um, production can be fly, fly, uh, quite um, uh, difficult um, uh, to to keep stable given the rain patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, the interesting thing is obviously I think you know it's a, short, a relatively short value chain. Um, it stays within an, in a small area. And so women, to a large extent, can monitor and control, actually, uh, most of, of the value chain, um, except maybe, you know, obviously, the, the, the distribution of the final product. Um, but even there, they are trying now to take this over and actually use it uh, and, and market it uh, uh, within the villages rather than going through governmental um, institutions. So um, one of the... Um, elements of success, as the, my predecessor said, was you know how to keep keep that uh, value chain stable, so that uh, uh, the the the, uh, the women can actually continuously invest and develop uh, develop the business. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of points that I would like to quickly um, really, uh, share. Just a couple of points. Um, uh, Telia asked, you know, the the role of uh, intermediary in not just training and capacity building, but but uh, um, you know, actually much more than that. Um, and I think that's that's exactly what is coming through from Yogesh and Edison's uh, you know examples. Uh, and there is something there, and let me just uh, take a second to to connect this back with some of the other discussion we are having that some of the people in this room might recognize is how does the 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 external player play an interventionist role versus facilitative role, and how much role does it pass on to the collectives and how much role does it play uh, yourself or or let the private sector play and that's an ongoing conversation uh, a, a lot of practitioners now are saying. You know the the NGO uh, or the uh, the civil society member uh, should play a more facilitative role rather than the interventionist role because they are short term um, uh, presence and they are short term projects. Um, and but these three uh, examples that have come uh, uh, to four here, uh, we are talking about you know long term engagement of these civil society organizations uh, to really handhold and facilitate those linkages and manage in some ways uh, that. Uh, 
political economy of the of the region in some ways. So it's an interesting contrast uh, of what what the other concessions have been having um, in in some ways. Um, the other thing that uh, comes to my mind uh, from uh, contrast from the from the African point of view is that the livelihood patterns and the and the, the family relations uh, are probably qualitatively different uh, in the two countries. And this is over generalization, but if I may venture to to say that um, the livelihoods uh, in, in Indian context are very, very connected between men and women. They, there are joint activities, there are joint decision making in, on, on many fronts. Whereas in many parts of, of Africa that I know, um, there is a bit of division between what what kind of activities men do and what kind of activities women do. Um, and there is also, you know, um, like for example, the cows and the, the uh, would be, you know, owned by and herded by men, whereas the goats and the small animals would be, uh, you know, taken care of and be the property of women, for example. Um, there are uh, so there are those cultural differences that actually play into some of these equations, I think. Uh, but that's a that's a, a subject that probably needs uh, inquiry uh, and further discussion. Maybe another webinar um, might be interesting on that. Um, I'll stop there and uh, ask anyone else uh, to uh, if they have any questions or comments to offer. I, I see uh, Yogesh uh, coming on board, so uh, Yogesh, please yeah. take a just just a few comments to address the, the the gender one and also the role of intermediary organization. I think in all the three cases uh, we were trying uh, the the organization was trying to address a, a market failure, and uh, in order to do that, uh, there is a role for uh, for uh, Subsidized uh, uh, inputs, or there's a role for uh, facilitating organization. For example, in, in case of uh, uh, the, the the producer company, uh, the pre cocoon activities uh, are heavily supported by the government, and that role now is currently being played by the NGO. So that's an ongoing role that the NGO uh, the NGO will continue to play. And and there is uh, there are there are resources. It's not that uh, the the NGO by playing a role is it's uh, making the organization inefficient. No, because uh, the the producer company itself starts its business once they purchase from the NGO. So it's kind of an ongoing relationship. The the the, the other one uh, was around uh, uh, around uh, gender and how these women actually see these activities, it's, it's very very interesting. If, and and a, a lot of contrast within these two cases of uh, the producer company and Seva. For example, in case of uh, the producer company, uh, the women uh, traditionally used to help their viewer husband in in uh, in making uh, these uh, uh, yarn totally manually. And it was their 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 client were, uh, uh, clients were their husbands who who used to weave. But with this intervention in, in uh, improving the technology where they can produce more yarn, they actually, uh, as a collective, can can sell to uh, to outside market as well. And and interestingly, these um, uh, MBTs or the, the producer collectives, uh, they work at the village level in, in production centers. And these production centers provide facility uh, for for childcare. So one of the uh, one out of the 20 uh, women members would uh, do uh, babysitting or, or will, will take care of the child. So that's one of the concerns for the producers. So that uh, when that is addressed, uh, they they see more of an involvement. This is in in very contrast to the Rudy Ben. The selection criteria for Rudy Ben is that you shouldn't be too young, you shouldn't be too old, you shouldn't have a kid because you have to travel uh, from uh, uh, to different places. So you shouldn't have a kid, you shouldn't have a, a, a livestock. And uh, you should be, uh, uh, you should have basic intelligence, but you should be willing to to travel. So in, in, that's totally different to what uh, producer company was doing. And and uh, the success factor was that they were able to select these kind of good events. So I think it's uh, uh, contextual as well. Uh, that is very very interesting uh, comment, um, uh, Yogesh. Um, there's one question on the floor from Marina. Um, and what happens in the long run uh, of SHGs? You know, and, and again, because we are at 10:30 now here in, in local time, which we have we just uh, you know closed. We need to end very soon. Soon, and there are you know we'll, we'll share some of the material that uh, around how does the second tier and the third tier institutions are evolving. Uh, of of how how they are becoming uh, counterpart to the intermediary 
and how they are interacting at the, at the federation level and the and the and the sec third year level. But um, for the sake of time, I think uh, we will probably have to close now. Yeah, it's already uh, one and a half hours over. So um, uh, I really we definitely enjoyed it here. Um, uh, it will be great to hear your feedback, and I'll, I'd like to now pass it on to uh, to Claudia uh, to close uh, the session. Thank you. Thank you, Anoush. Um, I want to thank um, Allison and Yogesh uh, for their excellent presentations and to all of you for your thought-provoking questions and comments. This webinar series uh, is a space that's bringing together all of you, practitioners and researchers who are working on, on women's collective action and, and trying to figure out how this can more effectively help women access markets. So we look forward to continuing these discussions with you in the future. Um, I, so without further ado, I will leave you with this final announcement of our next webinar, which will be held on April 12th uh, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. GMT. Uh, and the title is Women Producers um, Fair Trade and Women Producers, um, which will look at collective enterprises and um, access to markets. So, and this will be led by WeGo. So please stay tuned. You can check um, this uh, URL for information on upcoming webinars, and we will also be uploading the presentation from today as well as a summary of today's webinar on that site. Um, and we'll be sending you an evaluation because we are definitely interested in hearing your feedback so we can improve future webinars. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, I'm not bad. Not bad. Well done, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we, we covered a lot of them. Yeah, it was, it was really, I mean, those cases are fantastic. They're yeah. just so Hi, um, um, Claudia. Can you hear me? I think everybody else has left. Can we have a minute to, to touch base? Yeah. Hi, Claudia. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, it'll be great to just touch base for a minute uh, before we... Um, the project is okay. Two minutes are fine. To buy life, life stuff, and then certain, certain. So they, they, they start the energy. They are all the efforts to make the certain market bigger than them. They give it to them. And how can they do Are you? Are we talking slowly? Sorry. Yeah, she said, you know, give me a second. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, the reason uh, I'm also. Uh, Oops, it's recording still. I think we'd also 